Hi, my name is Ed McDonough. I'm the Public Information Officer for the Maryland Emergency Management Agency. And I'm gonna talk a little bit today about using GIS for public information, uh, trying to use it to communicate in all phases of emergency management. So there are a lot of reasons that GIS mapping can be very important for communications during an emergency. Um, for starters, uh, it's a lot easier for people to visualize things on a map uh, in many instances than to try and explain it to them. Um, it's usually better than using a narrative, although I would point out that for some uh, applications, you may also need a narrative. For example, we have evacuation zones in the state that I work in, Maryland, uh, for uh, a couple of nuclear power plants. And while we can certainly show those evacuation zones on a map, um, unless the map is a street level map, which is not always uh, feasible uh, for presentation or for uh, using in public information, we may also have to include, and in fact, on the uh, press releases that we put out when we do drills for emergency emergencies at nuclear power plants, uh, we do um, actually give a narrative of, of what the zone boundaries are. So you may need to use both language and maps to explain them, but many times maps can give a very quick visual uh, that people can understand. Uh, you need to make sure though that whatever map you use is going to work well in its ultimate destination. Um, maps may look very different in print than they do on a website, and they may look different from them than they do on social media platforms. And then if a radio, I mean, a TV uh, station, a news broadcast were to use it, it might look completely different there. So try to keep the end use in mind and the fact that there may be multiple end users uh, in mind as you create your maps. Um, it also uh, may be very helpful for the traditional media, uh, print media, uh, not so much in an emergency situation, but, but um, uh, to talk about um, communities or maybe mitigation projects, things like that. Uh, so for newspapers uh, or, or TV stations, uh, maps may be very helpful for them. Uh, for graphics and display purposes. Um, and it's important to remember that maps can be beneficial in all phases of an emergency, before, during, and after. And I'm going to go over the phases of emergency management that we typically use now and kind of talk a little bit about GIS in each area and also give an example in each area. So the first areas I'm going to talk about are preparedness and prevention. So this is what happens before things go bad. You can um, let the public know of typical threats and hazards that might affect their area. Again, I'll go back to, to the state of Maryland where I work. Uh, we stretch from the Atlantic coast all the way over to the Appalachian Mountains. We have uh, very diverse topography, geography, and demographics. And so um, the hazards that uh, affect the western part of the state in the Appalachian Mountains are a good bit different than the hazards that affect uh, Ocean City and the areas along the Atlantic Ocean. And then of course, much of central Maryland is along the Chesapeake Bay and in the Baltimore Washington Corridor. So uh, using maps to show people in their particular parts of your community, what their hazards are can be very beneficial. Um, you can help empower them. Uh, you can let people know um, how they might be able to evacuate. You can let people know uh, where uh, they might go to shelter or some of the um, best routes out. Um, just a lot of things that they can think about ahead of time. Um, they could uh, be made aware uh, for law enforcement folks of crime trends in their community and take the appropriate prevention measures for that. Um, you can work with the National Weather Service uh, to get mapping of historical activities, for example, you could get maps of tornado tracks in your state or your county over the years. Um, and that can show what parts of your area are most prone to tornadoes. And you can do that for other types of, of weather events also. National Weather Service has a very robust capability for that. And so I'm gonna give you one example here. This is uh, the evacuation zones in Calvert County, Maryland, which is the home of the Calvert Cliffs nuclear power plant. Now there are also evacuation zones in neighboring St. Mary's County, and also over on the Eastern Shore across the Chesapeake Bay from the plant in Dorchester County, a very small evacuation area over there. Uh, the evacuation zones are based on a 10 mile radius of the nuclear power plant. 
So this is a map that, that uh, Calvert County has on their website uh, to educate their public about the evacuation zones. Again, though, this is a zone where when we're doing uh, uh, media, we practice uh, nuclear power plant drills every other year uh, with these plants. And um, when we do a press release or, or uh, you know, a mock-up of a press release that we would use in a real event, we do also include the narrative in addition to the maps of the, uh, of the evacuation zones because these are not street level maps. It would be impossible uh, to use street level maps for the applications and the end users that we're working with. So this is why we, we do both. We give a narrative of the boundaries of the zone, but we also use these maps so people can get a general idea of the zone that they're in. So then there's the response phase. This is when things are going bad, when, when the storm is hitting, when the wildfires are burning out of control, uh, things along those lines. So this is where we have other needs or other uses for um, GIS mapping. Um, you can show weather watch and warning areas. And again, the, the National Weather Service puts out these on a very timely basis. Uh, you know, they're on social media, they're on their website. Um, you know, you can work with your local National Weather Service office to figure out the best way to include these mapping products in your suite and to make them available uh, for whatever method your agency or your jurisdiction is using to get this message out to the public. You can also use maps to show road closures, uh, bridges washed out or roads closed because of a blizzard or whiteout conditions or, or perhaps a, a chain reaction accident on a snow covered road. Uh, you can also use um, these maps to show power outages. Um, in the state of Maryland, we have a, a, a power outage map on our website that is updated uh, in real time, basically every 15 minutes uh, that shows the total number of power outages in the state. It also shows it broken down by county and also by zip code. Um, and we get feeds from about eight or nine different uh, power providers. There are a few small municipal and co-ops serving a few thousand residents that are not looped into that system. But all of the major co-ops and the major for-profit power companies are all looped into that system uh, to provide data, as I said, updated every 15 minutes, so very close to real time. Uh, that is one of the most popular um, uh, pages on our website during uh, severe storms or ice storms or anything that might be affecting power. You can also show snow and rain totals uh, as the event is progressing. And again, you can loop into the National Weather Service. They have uh, uh, products that can help you with that. And then again, um, you can show um, uh, areas that uh, people are being asked to evacuate or to shelter in place so that they have an idea of whether they should try to, um, you know, get to a, to a shelter or out of the area or whether they are better off uh, staying in their home. And so here's an example. I just uh, did a screenshot of this this morning of basically all of the um, uh, warning products uh, and alert products that are, are um, uh, with the National Weather Service on um, uh, March 22nd, on the morning of March 22nd. Um, and I didn't, was not able to pull the code over, but this would also have a key with it to explain the different colors. But you can see there's some coastal warnings along the Atlantic Ocean, and then there's some warnings down in the Southwest and some warnings along the West Coast and a few uh, in the mountain areas uh, in the upper Northwest. So a number of things going on around the country. This is a fairly quiet map by National Weather Service standards. So it uh, looks to be a fairly quiet day uh, on March 22nd weather-wise. So then recovery, after, after the, the storm or the incident has, has started um, slowing down or maybe you know a hurricane pulling away, uh, now we have to go in and clean up and get people back on their feet again. So what can we use mapping for during the recovery process? Uh, we can show reentry zones. Um, if an area has been evacuated and the authorities are going to begin to let people go back into their neighborhoods to check on their homes, you can use mapping to show those areas, uh, maybe a reentry, maybe a timeline, maybe they've already got a schedule of what days different communities will be able to reenter. So you can work with your local officials. Typically law enforcement is the lead agency on that. They're the ones that deem an area safe to return, but that's also often done in, in conjunction with emergency management and uh, uh, fire department and other uh, agencies that, uh, that can work with them on that. 
uh, you could map the location of open shelters. Um, one of the things you can do is preload shelter information into your mapping system. But the one thing I will caution is that emergency managers do not like to make public a list of all the shelters in their community. They want people to, to um, check and see what shelters are open in any given incident. There may be shelters that can't open because they don't have power or because they, are, they themselves are in a flood zone. Uh, there may be other reasons why a particular shelter won't open. So um, most local authorities will not want you to publicize the location of shelters until you're in the midst of an event and then you know direct people to shelters that are open. But you can certainly preload those locations into your, into your GIS system and then uh, basically flip a switch to show which ones are open at any given time. Um, when there's a, a major disaster, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency will work with state and local officials to open what are known as disaster recovery centers. And those are places where individuals or business owners can go to find out all the different programs that might be available to help them. Typically, there will be an area for the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Small Business Administration, and depending on what part of the country, maybe the Department of Agriculture, who may all have programs uh, available, and then there may be some state agencies there, including emergency management and you know, human services or social services, whatever they call it in your particular community. And then there may be local agencies that are there to help. There may be some nonprofits like the Red Cross who will have tables there. So that, that people, it's a, basically a one-stop shop for people to begin the recovery process. Um, you can show the location of open and closed essential services. Um, many states are now operating a business emergency operations center, and they are getting feeds from the private sector so that you can find out where there might be gas stations open, where there might be um, um, uh, big box stores open, home improvement stores open, uh, ATM machines that are working, pharmacies that are open. Um, this is an evolving um, uh, program in many areas. We have something in the in the. Uh, Eastern part of the United States called the All Hazards Consortium, which um, is basically a system that works with the uh, uh, emergency management business operation centers for many of the states uh, in the in the mid Atlantic area and, and adjacent areas. And um, they will they are trying to get very robust mapping now for these these services as they reopen. They are private sector. They're not required to do it, but they believe it's very important for them. Uh, to, to be able to get this information out to the public, particularly a public that's very stressed in trying to deal with um, uh, you know, a hurricane or a blizzard or whatever, tornado outbreak, whatever the, the issue has been. Um, this can also show uh, reopened roads and damaged roads and bridges or roads that may still be closed. Um, you can also, um, uh, in many uh, areas now, you can show where plows have been through so that uh, people may have a sense of what roads have been uh, treated either with plows or with um, uh, you know, de-icer, uh, depending on the nature of the storm. And then we can also uh, show uh, preliminary damage assessment areas. That's areas where officials uh, go to um, uh, survey damage uh, to see if an area may qualify for federal assistance uh, and also to begin to provide services for the people impacted by the storm. So that's something that um, uh, uh, those are some areas during recovery that you can look at. Uh, I've got a map here of something called the Waffle House Index. That was a, a phrase coined by uh, Craig Fugate, who was the um, uh, administrator for the Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, under President Obama. Um, he was from the South, from Florida. And um, one of the things that they, that they noted and, and that he in particular noted is how seriously an area was affected or how quickly the recovery was happening by whether the Waffle Houses were open or closed. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Waffle Houses tend to be open 24 seven. Um, you know, they're a kind of a staple for highway travelers and truckers. Um, and so um, if Waffle Houses are closed, that means that, that there's really severe damage in the area. There may be uh, severe power outages. There may be a lot of road closures. It may be that the employees were not able to get into work. So um, determining whether or not Waffle Houses are open or closed is kind of an offbeat, unofficial index of how severely uh, an area is damaged. And so I just captured a screenshot 
um, of, of a, a, a storm uh, hurricane several years ago. And you can see that there are 418 closed Waffle Houses and about 1,500 that are still open. And then the last phase I want to talk about is the mitigation phase. This is where we try to keep the same bad um, results uh, in the same area, most typically flood prone areas where flooding happens over and over again. Um, and so you can, you can map locations of repeated flooding and storm damage. Uh, then use this mapping and use that information to determine potential mitigation projects. Most common mitigation projects are for flood areas and they tend to be uh, two things. Uh, uh, FEMA will provide money so that the local jurisdiction can buy out the property owners and remove the buildings from that property and then keep it open space, uh, uh, you know, a linear park or, you know, uh, so you may have some damage to, you know, very minor things like park benches and walking trails, but there won't be the severe damage to buildings uh, that is very expensive and very costly. Um, it's also very difficult to insure buildings in those areas. Um, another thing that you can use it for um, is to find out where past mitigation projects have been done and then see if, if that's changing um, the damages in, in, in more recent events. So certainly um, flood mitigation is something that we're looking um, uh, at, at spending a lot of money on uh, to try and um, uh, reduce damages. Flooding is the biggest hazard in Maryland and quite frankly, it's the busy, biggest hazard in much of the country. Um, it also disproportionately in, it tends to impact uh, people who are of, of, uh, in, in uh, lower economic uh, areas. Um, we often think of, of uh, flooding and storm surge as, as beach homes and vacation properties, but the reality of it is that a lot of the flooding that happens in this country affects people uh, who live in low-lying areas because the real estate is cheaper there. Um, and so they tend to be disproportionately affected uh, by flooding. The other big issue that's cropping up now is that we are seeing flooding in areas that we traditionally did not see flooding in years past. And so uh, whether it was North Carolina a few years ago or the Houston area a few years ago, we're getting hurricanes now that, that are sometimes uh, depositing amounts of water way beyond uh, what, what has happened historically. And so areas that were not considered to be in flood zones have been flooding. And that's creating a lot of problems because many times those people are not required to have flood insurance. And then it becomes very costly. Uh, it takes a toll on, on, the, on the families and the business owners, but it also takes a toll on the uh, governments that have to, to fund the rebuilding effort. So we're, we're learning as we go along uh, these weather maps, these, these historical data uh, change over time, and we're seeing it evolving before our eyes. So it's very important to understand uh, the role that mapping can play uh, in the whole mitigation process. And just one example here. So in Louisiana, uh, they have a river drainage basin map, which shows which rivers, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what, the flood, what, what the watersheds are for the various river systems in Louisiana. Um, and so that's one of the tools that they use to determine how they're going to, to work on mitigation projects based on the, um, you know, the things that are happening in those different watersheds. So that's just a tool that one state is using uh, to try and help uh, with their mitigation planning. So a couple of tips that I think are important uh, for using um, uh, GIS in, uh, emergency public information or public warning. Um, I, I think um, uh, public information and social media staff uh, should be working with the uh, GIS professionals at their agency or in their jurisdiction uh, ahead of time during what we call the sunny day periods. So if you are not, uh, if you're a GIS professional and you're not working with your uh, public information folks or social media folks, now would be a good time to reach out to them. And if you're in the public information specter, reach out to your, to your GIS professionals. You may not have a GIS person in your agency. Uh, in some smaller jurisdictions, that is the case. There may not be a, a, a GIS person dedicated solely to your agency, but there may be GIS folks working in economic development or planning and zoning or other land use agencies. They can be very helpful partners because 
a lot of the issues that they deal with in terms of land use, and, you know, where buildings are and things like that could be very useful uh, for your uh, uh, use of GIS in the emergency management public information realm. Um, have base maps prepared ahead of time. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we have two nuclear power plants that we deal with in Maryland. Uh, we have mapping ahead of time uh, at the local level and also uh, at a not, not quite the same level of detail, but also at the state level. We have maps of those evacuation zones. Uh, because Calvert Cliffs is located along Chesapeake Bay, we also have a zone maps uh, that show different zones of the Chesapeake Bay and the Patuxent River that could be closed if there were to be an accident at, uh, at Calvert Cliffs Nuclear Power Plant. So we have those maps with their zones preloaded. And then as we're, we're doing an exercise or heaven forbid in a real world event, we could then um, uh, take that, that information and show on a map what areas are closed to boaters and marine traffic. Uh, in addition to the, to the land-based uh, models that we use for evacuation zones. Coordinate with other agencies and nearby jurisdictions. I mentioned earlier, <coughs> excuse me, about working with um, economic development or planning and zoning or uh, law enforcement or fire or other agencies that may have uh, GIS capabilities. Um, uh, work together as a team. Uh, when there's an emergency, uh, you may need to see if those people can work as part of your emergency operations center, particularly if you may need to do mapping on a 24 hour basis. You may need to have a team of people who can help. And again, you know, a good time to test that out is when your uh, local community has an emergency management exercise or training exercise. Uh, that would be a good time to practice doing GIS mapping and having people, uh, you know, uh, from different agencies working together on that. Um, and also neighboring jurisdictions, um, you know, again, our, our evacuation zones for, for many uh, areas, whether it be our uh, nuclear power plants, we also have something called Know Your Zone for people who live in low-lying areas along the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean and their tributaries. Um, and, and again, those evacuation zones go through multiple jurisdictions. So it's very important to work together uh, on those, or perhaps the state uh, if you're a local agency, the state could coordinate uh, multiple jurisdictions working together. And then be mindful of accessibility issues. Um, one of the lessons we learned, I mentioned our Know Your Zone evacuation uh, program in Maryland. We learned a couple of lessons with that. Um, we created uh, with ESRI and uh, uh, the State Department of Planning, uh, we created an interactive map where people could type in their address, their street address, to find out if they were in one of the uh, evacuation zones in Maryland. And we have them labeled A, B, and C uh, for ease of, of memory. Um, and so we were encouraging people. Uh, we, we, we launched this website with a lot of information about what to do if you're asked to evacuate and, and, and linking to information about hurricanes and other and nor'easters and other storms that could trigger uh, uh, you know, an evacuation in their area. Um, and, and, and we had the launch and we encouraged people to go and type in their email address. Well, the launch was successful because a lot of people wanted to do it. The problem is uh, that so many people wanted to do it that it crashed the system. Um, I'm not an expert on Esri maps, but I understand the interactive maps that have a lot of layers of data, particularly flood data and then evacuation data and things like that, um, eat up a lot of bandwidth. And so, um, uh, you know, if we, we work with, with Esri and, and with our state GIS folks to improve the capacity and the bandwidth of that, of that mapping program, uh, but it really did create a problem. But the other thing we learned is that many of the uh, mapping products that are available to, the, to government agencies out there um, are not 508 compliant. That is, uh, they're not compatible, for example, with screen readers, so that people who are visually impaired uh, can, can have information uh, read to them on their computer. Their computer can actually read text and explain things to them. That's very hard to do with a mapping program. Um, so that is a challenge. Uh, to my knowledge, it's not a challenge that has been solved yet. Um, so you may need to work with your uh, communications folks. Perhaps you have disability coordinators or equal rights uh, coordinators in your community who might be able to offer some tips on how to work around that. Uh, some of it uh, for static maps uh, can certainly be done with um, uh, providing some text, some alternative text 
that would be available for screen readers explaining what's on a map. Uh, but if a map is dynamic or interactive, uh, that is a very, very tricky and difficult situation. And I'm not sure that there's been an, an answer to that yet, but as best you can, uh, keep the visually impaired folks in mind. One of the most important things you can do with maps is make sure that there's appropriate contrast. And you can go online and find um, uh, uh, programs out there that can measure the contrast of your graphics, of maps, uh, to make sure that, that people who are visually impaired, uh, even if they don't have access to a screen reader, they can tell the difference or they can make out the difference uh, in, in the shades or the colors. Um, if you have two colors that are too close together, like a, a reddish orange and a red right next to each other, it's very hard for, for visually impaired people to make that distinction. But if you have red, green, blue, purple, black, white, you know, colors that contrast with each other, um, and it's particularly uh, important if you're just using two colors uh, to make sure there's, there's enough contrast. So certainly keep uh, accessibility needs in your mind. There are online resources you can go to. Again, some of that is very difficult with interactive and, and, and dynamic maps, but certainly if you're putting together static maps, uh, you can certainly um, come up with some ways to use alternative text and other methods to make, uh, to make the maps uh, uh, more user friendly for those that are visually impaired. Um, and there are other people too. Um, you have to worry about uh, bright flashing lights, for example, because some people have a disability where a, a strobe type light or a bright flash could um, uh, trigger a, a seizure. So uh, there are a lot of things to consider. Many of them don't involve mapping, uh, but just you know, be aware of those things as you're as you're working on your uh, on your um, outreach methods and how to how to integrate uh, GIS maps. Uh, into um, into the um, process. Um, again, I, I can't stress how important mapping can be, uh, particularly for for an emergency where people um, need to evacuate or need to take action. Um, it's not so important if it's uh, you know if it's a minor event, uh, but certainly uh, when when we're calling people to action and we need to to make it clear what people need to do it. Uh, maps can be an incredibly important visual tool uh, to work with. And that's all I have for my presentation today. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Uh, I hope it's been helpful. Um, I am going to have a slide here uh, with contact information for me. I would be more than happy if you want to reach out to me, uh, preferably by email, uh, but I do have my phone number on there. I also have our agency webpage and you can follow uh, MEMA on uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, at MD MEMA. Uh, we are also on Instagram. Uh, we are, uh, we have a YouTube channel. Um, you know, so there are a number of outlets that you can follow us on social media and you can find those links to our social media pages uh, on our, on our website. I also, by the way, am personally on Twitter at uh, Ed McDonough one. Uh, and I'm also on Facebook. So if you want to find me there, I'd certainly be happy to, uh, to discuss uh, any issues related to this with you there. And with that, uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.